Well, naturally, as has already been made very clear, this Tuesday will be 500 years since Martin Luther stepped up to the front of the church there in Wittenberg in Germany. And he nailed a document of 95 statements to the front door. That very act itself probably seems a little odd to us in our 21st century position. Looking back on that, maybe it even appears like something of a, an act of vandalism. But in Luther's day, that was the common way to, to post a notice, we might say, or to make an announcement. He was actually calling for a public debate. We think about that and try and think about that for today. Perhaps a modern equivalent would be that it would be like launching a provocative blog, a blog post where you're inviting online discussions with maybe fellow university lecturers. That would be something similar, but probably not even quite as spectacular. Those 95 theses were written in Latin. And Latin was the language of the 16th century academic world. And the primary issue that Luther was addressing throughout all of those points, that the primary thing that he was addressing was, it was a protest against the church's sale of indulgences, among other things, to fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And all of that was done under the guise of providing reduction of time or reduction of punishment for sin. And effectively, the sale of indulgences in the mind of that thinking was it bought you forgiveness of sins. That was their thinking that, that not only did it do that, but they had another purpose. It, it helped uh, fund or finance the Pope's grand building program that he had, including paying Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Luther, in this very act, was publicizing his intended debate on the eve of All Souls Day, that's the 1st of November, where pilgrims would be expected to file past and see the thousands of uh, relics that were on display in the Wittenberg church with the hope that as they saw them, that could take hundreds, if not thousands of years of them or their relatives' time in purgatory. You see, Luther's act of nailing his thesis was far more than an academic exercise. He, he was, it would seem, even more so motivated by deep pastoral concerns. Because Luther understood that there were some things at play with this that had eternal consequences. And of course, at the time, Luther had no idea that his action would have such a momentous effect and impact. In many ways, his own thinking had more yet to develop by that, by in the year 1517. But even so, Luther at that point could spy out some major problems. And it really, in his thinking, was all boiling down in the end to a crisis with authority and a confusion over eternity. And, and they are the two things, friends, that I'd like for us to explore this afternoon. I, I want to draw out, if you like, two stabilizing truths that reemerged during the Protestant Reformation that answered the crisis with authority and as well helped in, in bringing understanding with the confusion over eternity. As we do that, I hope to highlight that though 500 years have passed, Still, today, there is a crisis with authority in our nation. There is a crisis uh, with authority even in much of the Christian church today. And there is confusion over eternity. Possibly even with you this afternoon. I'd like to root all of this in the passage that we just read before in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so if you have that there... Have it nearby because we're going to look at that in a minute. But the two things then that we're looking at, firstly of those two things, a crisis with authority. And though Luther was raised in the church, you know, it wasn't until Luther was 20 years old when he was completing his master's degree uh, for, uh, for law at the Erfurt University that he first saw a copy of the Bible. 
He didn't see a copy till he was 20. And he found it in the university library. By 1505, that's just within two years later, he had entered the monastery and it was then that Luther received his own copy of the Bible. Luther tells how the Chancellor and the Chair of the Bible Department didn't even own a, a Bible until many years after he earned his doctorate. And what this illustrates is that, that th this, there were very few people in that time who had access to the Bible. And even those who did, they had to be able to, to read Latin for it to be any good. And certainly the common people did not know Latin. In fact, most of the ministers in the church only knew enough Latin just to stumble through the Mass. And so overall, can you see, there was this widespread ignorance of God's Word, the Bible. And friends, every time that the Bible is either ignored, or the Bible is put aside, or the Bible is, is rejected, that society, that group of people, that church perhaps, that family or that individual crumbles morally. That was the case in Luther's day. Even though he was surrounded by religion, even though there was all this religious authority, the Bible had basically been put aside. There was what we might call a crisis with authority. In the end, the people just had to listen to the church and what the church told them to believe. And they didn't need a Bible themselves, that's what they were told. And so when Luther was sent to Rome in 1510 with the hope that that might help him overcome his deep personal struggle, he came home after that journey even further disillusioned due to due in part to the corruption that he saw in that society. Actually, all the way along on his journey, he was horrified by the immorality of the people and the clergy. He went to what they called the holy city. But once he was in Rome, he was grieved by the corruption. And when he walked down the streets of Rome, he heard visitors comment, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. Crime flourished in that culture and on the streets. He was amazed at the corruption in the city, including the gross immorality of many clergy who had taken vows of celibacy. He was appalled at the religious hypocrisy in the church. Things were so bad in the streets, Pope Julius was so concerned for the safety of visitors to Rome that he instructed the chief police to take whatever action was needed to curb the violence. Luther recorded that the, the city is filled with disorder and murder. And, and, and some years later, Luther quotes a, a Catholic church cardinal who said, Rome is a filthy, stinking puddle full of the wickedest wretches in the world. We hear all that. But friends, why do young ladies today feel unsafe walking down our streets at night? Why is our nation largely silent about the tens of thousands of unborn babies that are being murdered in their mother's wombs? Why this increasing problem of domestic violence in our society? Why the recent steps in Victoria to embrace euthanasia? You see, it's the same underlying issue. The Word of God is pushed aside, it's ignored, it's totally rejected. There's a crisis with authority. There was a crisis in authority when it comes to the 16th century Europe, and I believe we find the same today. It may manifest itself slightly differently, but underneath we have the same issue. Yes, in the 16th century church, they had the Bible. But in the end, it was the church councils. It was the edicts from the popes which, which were regarded as the final authority. And the Bible was pushed aside, even though they said they had the Bible. Ultimately, the Bible was pushed aside, and therefore the church and society was in a mess. 
Proverbs 29 and verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And often people hear that and I think they get the wrong idea with what the Hebrew is saying there and what that verse actually means. The idea is when there is no declaration of biblical truth, the people cast off restraint every time. Where there is no biblical truth declared, people live how they like. They cast off restraint, be that the 16th or be that the 21st century. I'm saying the same thing, really, when the Bible is put aside. It affects everything. It affects society, it affects the church, it affects the family, it affects marriage, it affects you, and it affects me. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. It is a crisis with authority. And our society, I believe, is one where increasingly we know there are no absolutes as our society is thinking, and therefore what are we witnessing? We are witnessing in our generation this horrible moral chaos. Man is left to come up with his own ideas. He can form his own definition, even with marriage. Create our own standards. And the society will crumble. It will be marked by the casting off of restraint. You know, 1,500 years prior to Luther, the Apostle Paul lay in a cold Roman prison cell awaiting execution. He knew that very soon he would, his head would be lopped off and it would fall into an executioner's a wicked basket. He, he understood what was coming in his life and, and he knew that he needed to pick up his pen and write one more time and that's what he does in 2 Timothy. He writes to Timothy... The man who was pastoring the church in Ephesus. What does he say when he writes to him? Well, some of the last words of Paul are about the Holy Scriptures. And Paul places it within the broader context of a godless and a decaying society. If you have the Bible, look with me at the very first verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 where he says, verse 1, And know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Did you get that? That is like a, a, a summary of watching the TV news every night. That's like a a brief summary of picking up the daily newspaper. Isn't that description so up to date? My friend, don't listen to people who might say that the Bible is a dusty old book that has nothing to say about our times. Those verses are as contemporary as it gets. That's a description of first century Rome, where Paul was. That's a description of first century Ephesus where Timothy was. It's a description that Luther witnessed in the 16th century and and I believe it's much a description of our time as well. And Paul wanted Timothy to know how he was to minister in such a time as he describes there. And so he goes on to say, if you've got the Bible, follow with me. We drop down the passage to verse 14, where he directly gives instruction to Timothy by using the word you. We can put in place there Timothy, because that's who he's writing to in the first place. He says, but you, Timothy, must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. He's saying, Timothy, hold on to the things that you have learned from your youth. You have known the Holy Scriptures. You see, this is what the Christians in the Ephesian church needed. The Bible. People in that society needed The Bible. They needed God's truth. This is the truth that we need today. It's needed in our nation. It's needed in our churches. It's needed in our families. God's holy scriptures. 
And yet as we look around today, there seems to be everything else but almost. There's philosophies and there's gurus and there's gadgets, of course, and there's entertainment and there's programs. But there's little Bible. Why do we need the Bible? Because of what the Bible is, my friends. The Bible is God's written word to men. Verse 16 says, all scripture, scripture is given by inspiration of God. Of God. He uses that term, inspiration. You know when we watch some outstanding sport, sporting achievement, maybe you're like me, you love to watch Usain Bolt run. I mean, you, you watch him run his, his 100 metres or his 200 metres. Or maybe if you listen to some brilliant orchestral performance or some stirring artist really nail that song. And we might respond and we might say, that was inspirational. When Paul uses the word inspiration here, he does not mean that. That's more often how we use the term. That's not what Paul means. The idea of inspiration in the Greek language, which is Paul using here, simply means breathed out. And so he's saying God breathed out the words of the Bible, all of them. And so this is telling us not what a writer like maybe David uh, was inspired to write some, new, some nice words or some lovely poetry, or Moses or, or Paul. No, what they wrote, God, we might say, expired. God breathed out. God exhaled the, the very words that they wrote down. Have you ever noticed that when you speak, you are exhaling? You try and speak while you're inhaling. Breathed out words. That's the idea. Each of the words that we read in the Bible are God's words. And so that means God, He is the, the, the one supreme over all. He is the one who speaks to us in the Bible. God Himself gives the Bible its authority because God has authority. He's the author. There's no authority that can compete with God's authority. The Bible, you see, therefore, is as an authoritative book because it is a God-breathed book. Yes, it's true that God used many men over the period of some 1,500 years, but God got written precisely what God wanted to get written. And that means that the Bible is like no other book. It is utterly unique, and it is very, very precious. It's without error because it comes from the God who cannot lie. It comes from the God who is always consistent and faithful to himself. It comes from the God who is truth. And so what does that mean? It means that we are bound to believe all that this book teaches, not just the parts that we like or that fit our preconceived ideas. We are, are, are bound before God to not only believe, but to obey all that this book directs us to do, because this is God speaking to us. You know, Luther came to see that very truth clearly. He said, when the Bible speaks, we assuredly believe that God himself speaks to us. And so the word of God is our final authority in all that we believe and all that we practice. As has already been said this afternoon, that's summarized in, in one of the solas of the Reformation. That is scripture alone. And that's the first stabilizing truth that re-emerged in the Reformation. And I believe it's one that we urgently need today in our generation. Surely we are living in a time where there is a crisis with authority within our nation. We see it before our eyes. And we can even identify it in, in many parts of the Christian church. And it all boils down to this issue that Paul raised with Timothy. The Bible's authority, the Bible's inerrancy, and the Bible's sufficiency. It's the first, it's the fundamental battle cry of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura was the Latin, Scripture alone. This book is profitable. It's useful. 
That's the verse. It tells us it's profitable. It doesn't do any good sitting on that shelf gathering dust. It's profitable. It's for a use. And it's sufficient for the very purpose for which it was given. If you look back at the passage in verse 16, we'll keep reading. It says, And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There is nothing that needs to be, there is nothing that can be added to this book for us to know how to be saved and how to live for the glory of God in this world. There is nothing. Did you get that? Nothing. No dream, no so-called private revelation, no vision can be added to this. Luther commented even on these things in his day. He says, when you hear anyone boast that he has something by inspiration of the Spirit and it has no basis in God's Word, no matter what it may be, tell him that it's the work of the devil. He also said, any teaching that does not square with Scripture is to be rejected, even if it snows miracles every day. He was pretty clear. But it was particularly the place of church councils that effectively usurped authority over the Scripture, which, which caused Luther's strongest reply. And it all came to a head on the 18th of April, 1521, when he stood before those judges at the Diet of Worms, which in many ways was his trial. And he famously said these words, and many of you will know them, Unless I am convinced by the Scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it's well known that they have often erred and contradict themselves, I am bound to the Scriptures, and my conscience is captive to the Word of God. He went on to say, I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand, so God help me. That was an arrogance. That was a man who understood what the Bible is. And that was a man who submitted his life to the Scriptures as he submitted his life to the God of the Scriptures Scripture alone, it's what is needed today. And sadly, we are living at a time when even many within the Christian church, I think, have actually lost confidence in the Bible. They've lost confidence in this. And it's almost as if the thinking is, well, you know, yes, it's, it's authoritative, but God's Word needs a hand. You know, it really can't cut it anymore in modern society. It needs to be spiced up a little in the church. But really, what's going to make it work and what's going to make an impact is we've got to have the right music, we've got to really improve the lighting, we've got to have all the props on a stage. Friends, can you not see that that is like taking us back 500 years to all the external props Maybe they're modern ones of the smells and bells, but they're external props. No, we need Scripture alone. The Word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Scripture alone because Scripture is sufficient. It's not Scripture plus tradition. It's not Scripture plus counsels. It's not Scripture plus dreams. It's Scripture alone. And so let me ask you, my friend, do you love the Bible? Do you read the Bible? This is God's message to you. Are you ignoring Him? Are you in a church where there is little Bible? To me, it seems very sad that for many Christians today, they don't even need to take their Bibles to church. Something is very, very wrong. Here's why there's a crisis with authority in both Luther's day and our day. We need this first stabilizing truth as a foundation in our lives, in our families, in our churches, and in our nation. Scripture alone, there's a crisis with authority, and Scripture alone is the truth that answers it. 
The second, and I'll try and be briefer, thing I draw to your attention is a confusion over eternity. A confusion over eternity. The story of Martin Luther in the years especially between 1505 and 1520 is a story of deep personal struggle. And, and his main struggle truly boiled down to one basic question. How do I, Martin Luther, get right with God? You see, Luther knew he was a sinner. He knew he had broken God's law, like every one of us here. As Romans 3 teaches, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so how was he, or how are we, to be reconciled with this righteous God who must punish sin in his justice? You see, Luther had this deep-seated confusion over how to be ready for eternity. But Luther's not the only one like that. Many today are confused over being ready for eternity. Maybe you are. I'm amazed how, how people can sit in churches for years and still be confused over how to be ready for eternity. Luther had been raised in the context of the, the whole religious thought that you've just got to do this religious deed or you've got to buy this indulgence or you've got to go to Mass or you've got to try your best and it basically boiled down to do, do, do. But the more Luther tried to please God with his do, the greater conviction of sin grew in his conscience. He knew deep within it was hopeless. How can I ever please a righteous God because my best is never going to meet perfection. If you look with me back in the passage in 2 Timothy, I believe there's some answers here in verse 15 where it says, Paul says to Timothy, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Timothy, it's in the Bible that you discover a message about God. It's in the Bible that you learn that God is your creator and that you are accountable to him. It's in the Bible that you find a message about sin and your guilt. It's in the Bible that you find the message about who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. That he came into this world to save sinners. You see, the Bible's message, Timothy, it's not about you. Do, do, do. It's about what Jesus has already done done. In the Bible, Timothy, you found the gospel and, and that is also a summons to faith and repentance. Timothy, this is what your mother taught you. This is what your grandmother taught you. This is even what I taught you from the scriptures you found it in the Bible, Timothy. The, the, the scriptures make you wise to salvation. And friends, it was, it was as Luther studied the Bible for himself that he discovered the answer as to how to be made right with God. In 1512, he became a doctor of theology in the Wittenberg University and he began to lecture the Bible. And it was as he studied and he taught Psalms and then he taught Romans and then he taught Galatians and then he taught Hebrews, he found the scriptures truly did make him wise for salvation. If you look back at verse 15, where Paul reminds Timothy of how he and anyone else can be saved. Did you see that before? How can you be saved? It's, it tells us in verse 15, Paul tells Timothy, the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. Salvation, he says, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here, friends, is the second stabilizing truth that re-emerged in the Reformation. Faith alone. Or it's in Latin, sola fide, faith alone. How is someone made right with God? How can you be spared the just punishment for sin? Well, here's the answer. It's by faith. Not faith plus my baptism. Not, not faith plus going to church. But the answer is here, it's by faith in Christ Jesus because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that's for God's glory alone. And where's that found? It's found in the Bible 
alone. You don't find it anywhere else. You don't find it in the Quran. You don't find it in the Book of Mormon. You don't find it anywhere else but in the Bible. But to say that the only way I'll be saved and ready for eternity is by faith in Christ, that, that's easier to say than it is actually to swallow. And this was, you see, Luther's big sticking point and confusion. Because in his pride, he was constantly trying to do works of righteousness to earn his way up into God's favour. And it was only really when he got to the point of realising that his works of righteousness are never good enough. And that the righteousness that he needed, that you and I need, is not our own righteousness, but we actually need someone else's righteousness. And Luther called it alien righteousness. We, we all know what an alien is. An alien doesn't come from earth, right? It comes from somewhere else. It's outside of our realm. And that's what, that's what Luther says. We need alien righteousness. We need a righteousness outside of ourselves. What righteousness? The perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's given to us as a gift. It's not a merit. We don't earn it. It comes to us by faith. Not by our works. Not by our efforts. Not by being Mr. Good Citizen. And friends, this struggle of confusion that Luther went through is one that is not isolated to him alone. In fact, stop and think for a moment, that the human penman that wrote this last book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, Paul himself had to wrestle with this issue. And I'm going to ask you to turn to one other passage, and this is where we'll conclude. It's to the book of Philippians. It's to another one of Paul's epistles, or his letters. And in Philippians chapter 3, he tells on himself, we might say. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3, from verse 3, where he says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm also. You get that? Paul says, I saw myself as being in a pretty good way. When I compared my life to other people's lives, I saw myself as pretty well on the top of the pile. I was confident that God would accept me. I mean, look at my life. I mean, overall, I, I've, I've been doing pretty good for myself. I mean, it's all pretty good. Look at verse 5, because he actually starts to show us how good it was. Circumcised the eighth day, that was important for a Jew, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. God had to humble Paul as he had to humble Luther. Has he humbled you? Or do you still think that you're doing okay? Thank you very much. Are you still thinking that my good works will get me into heaven? If that's what you are thinking, though you don't see it this way, I'm sure, but you are confused. You are confused compared to the clarity of the Bible. Because it doesn't work that way. It has never worked that way and it will never ever work that way for you or for anyone else. God's word is true. There's no error in the Bible. And, and in here in this passage, we are told how good Paul's deeds really were. Actually, Paul tells on himself. Keep reading verse 7. He says, But what these things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for Christ, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And now what's he say? I count them all up. I put them all in a big tally. I pile them all together, he says, and I count them as rubbish. 
<laughs> this is graphic language. He says, all the best that I can count up in my life is nothing more than a lump of dung. It's nothing more than a pile of poo. I mean, this, this is not pretty, this description. He's saying, it's a heap of rubbish. That's the best that I've ever done. It's a heap of rubbish. And that's why I need Jesus Christ and I need His righteousness. You see, He's not interested in my righteousness because it's nothing more than a load of rubbish before Him. Paul, Luther, and you and I need to be found in Christ. If you keep reading, the bottom of verse 8 says that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. I need to be in Christ. I need to be covered with the righteousness of Christ if I will ever be ready for eternity. But if you're still confused, if you still can't quite get it, Paul makes it abundantly clear in verse 9. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Our only hope of salvation is is in receiving the gift of righteousness from God. Where do we learn that? We learn that in the Scriptures alone. The Scriptures make us wise for salvation. Salvation is through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so, friends, here are the two stabilizing truths that re-emerged 500 years ago and are just as needed, much needed today as they were then. Scripture alone and faith alone. It is only by Scripture alone that the crisis with authority is rectified. It is only by faith alone in Christ alone that the confusion over eternity is resolved. It was resolved for Paul. It was resolved for Timothy. It was resolved for Luther. Is it resolved for you? Are you ready? For eternity? You've heard the gospel this afternoon, the good news concerning salvation in Jesus Christ. After we've had our meal, if you're able to stay, we'll all leave this hall. Will you leave this hall right with God? Ready to face God, the judge, when you die? Are you ready for eternity? Well, it'll never happen by your own efforts or your good works. You must leave your sin. You must place the weight of your soul on Jesus Christ, His person, and His work on behalf of sinners. You can cry out to God in your seat right now, and you can ask Him as you sit there, Lord, save me. You can ask Him to give to yourself the gift of righteousness as you sit there in your seat. You can ask Him to do it and He will give you this gift that He promises to those who seek Him and they will find this. God never lies. He never lies. Everything in His Bible is true. And in His Bible He promises us that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I say to you, my friend, if you are here and this is starting to make sense and you realize that right now you are not right with God and you understand now how you can get right with God, then I would encourage you to call out to Christ for salvation tonight. Whoever you are, you may have been in church for years and you've been confused about this thing. Maybe you need to humble yourself. All of us who are saved here, we've had to humble ourselves and realize that we can't do it. If God would save you tonight, this will be a night of celebration, not because of 500 years since the, the, the Reformation alone. This will be a night of celebration for you if God would save you, a night of celebration forever.
that by the grace of God that you got right with God through faith alone in Christ alone. And that, my friends, will be to the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you to thank you that you are a God of grace. We thank you for the way in which you teach us and show us your truth in the word. Thank you. Oh God, thank you for the men that have gone before us, for the blood that they shed, for the lives that they yielded up so that we now have a Bible in our own language. And thank you that it's in the Bible that we find this message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Help us to be Christians who have confidence in the Word of God. Help us to be those that truly are trusting in you, Lord Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.